Welcome to Bits and Bobs. The show where we bring you tabletop gaming news and entertainment from around the globe. So grab a nice coffee and sit back. And let us welcome you to our table. Hi everyone, my name is Monique from a channel called Before You Play, and today I'd like to talk about a topic that I've been thinking about lately, which is re-examining our personal gaming biases. I'm not sure if that is the proper title for this topic, but we're gonna go with it. <laughs> my favorite genre of board gaming are heavy strategy games, and so one of my absolute favorite things to do is to teach other people how to play Vitalis Sorta games, which have been known to be quite heavy. And so naturally, when speaking with other gamers who don't typically play them, I get a fair amount of pushback due to the stereotypes associated with heavy gaming that often prevents people from even trying these games. Because maybe they're too daunting, they have too many rules, they're too long, various reasons. And these preconceived barriers will sometimes lead people to avoid these games because they either feel like they can't handle it or that they just won't enjoy them. My point here is what if we've been missing out on so many wonderful gaming experiences because of our own personal gaming biases and preconceived notions? I know I have. Allow me to share some examples. For me personally, anytime I used to see any kind of like minis on a map type of games, that would be like a nope, nope, not for me. Until one day, someone convinced me to play this. Can it. And then I was sold. <laughs> this game, mm, so good. Also, not a big fan of super dry Euro games, even though my partner loves them. Then I played Kalimala. Seeing this on the table made me not necessarily want to play it, but after playing it, well, we obviously own it now, so. <laughs> Train games? Mm -mm, not for me. But then I played ugh, Age of Steam, which led me to actually play an 18xx game, which I'm still kind of warming up to, but at least I made the leap. Another fantastic game, by the way. And I understand that these biases are in place partly to help guide our spending habits, so they do serve a purpose. But I suppose my point here is, if you can, give that game a try. Because who knows, a whole world of gaming may just open up for you. Thanks everyone! Have a wonderful rest of your day! Attending conventions can be a really fun way to explore the board game hobby. Most conventions are geared toward adults, but I'm here to tell you that kids can have a ton of fun at a show as well. Because I'm not able to physically attend shows, I thought it would be helpful to prepare families with children for what they might expect when things get back to normal, or whatever the new normal will be. First is the important stuff, safety. I wear this hat in either the shirt or the hoodie version. Bright colors that stand out are always good. The big conventions, but hopefully all of them, publish maps online. Like when you go to an amusement park, knowing the exits and a meeting spot if you get separated are very important. We tend to meet up at a company booth that we know well and stands out. Be sure to talk to the staff when you get your badges. Identify convention workers slash volunteers so that your children know how to spot one if you're separated. My parents take a picture of me before we enter so that they can show staff in an emergency what I look like. This is scary stuff, and you'll probably never need to think of it, but it is important to be prepared. Conventions, especially big ones, can be loud, crowded, and confusing. If you or your child are intimidated by all you see, be sure to take a little break. Some shows even have a special quiet room. Days can be long. Stay hydrated. You'll also get hungry. Most conventions have a restaurant or food trucks. Eat throughout the day, or else your stomach will make you regret it. Some shows might not allow outside food, so make sure you're prepared. I said earlier that the big conventions publish maps. These often show the booth numbers and company names. Board Game Geek releases lists beforehand where you can learn about each publisher's games a bit more. We make a list from the entrance we plan on going through to the exit to make sure we hit everything we want to see. At our first Origins, we kind of just wandered and we didn't even see half the show. At Essen, we were prepared and still only saw about half the show. Yeah, that one is big. Because the booth people are doing their job, which is to promote and sell, they're likely going to focus on your parents. That makes sense, but we were more likely to spend time at a booth with those that involved me even before I became the cardboard kid. If a publisher only talks to your dad, brother, whatever, and ignores your mom, sister, and other women, walk away. Hey buddy, girls are gamers too. Not a lot of people in the board game world focus on the kids' point of view. 
But when it comes down to it, games are toys. Why shouldn't kids play as big as a role as teens and adults? Involve us too. Don't feel pressured to buy anything. Trying games, making new friends, seeing old ones, and just experiencing the show is worth it. Most conventions have a game library where you can borrow games to play at the show. It's a great way to meet people and try new games. You don't even have to go through the vendor areas if you don't want to. It is fun to check out the booths though. I love going to shows and I was really sad that everything was canceled this year. I met and game with some of the people appearing in this video with me at shows and I can't wait to do that again. I hope that this helped you prepare for conventions and who knows, maybe my interviews help you discover new creators and my reviews help you discover new games. Hi, my name is Benita and today I want to focus on old games. Sometimes it's really hard to not get swept up in a hype train that exists in the board game hobby and I'm really guilty of this as well. So I want to take the next few segments and talk about some of the games that made me fall in love with modern board games in the first place. So today I want to introduce you or reintroduce you to Carcassonne. Carcassonne is a tile placement game in which players randomly uh, draw tiles and place it on the slowly forming board. This game is so unique because you're essentially building your own player board. It's something I had never seen before. Um, after a player decides to where they want to place the tile, they now they have to decide if they want to place their meeple onto the tile or decide to not place it on the tile. And this game actually introduced the word meeple in our vocabulary, for better or worse. Uh, over time, I realized how deliciously mean Carcassonne can be. Uh, you can play it nice, but after a while, at least my game group, we got kind of competitive and it made that even more fun. It's really cool to maneuver a piece where you ruin a person's castle or road. These days, when I play, I usually play using a three tile variant I found on Board Game Geek. Basically, that means instead of drawing one tile at the end of the turn, I always make sure I have three tiles in hand. It allows us to have like a little bit more flexibility and strategy when playing the game. So my game group includes my parents and brother and this is some of the things that they had to say. It's simple. It's conniving. You snicker a lot like I'm going to get you. That was my dad. Uh, it's exciting. And finally, you can use a lot of interesting strategies when you're building castles or playing with the farmers. Um, rules. And to clarify, the farmer's rules are recommended after your first few times playing because they're a little bit more confusing, but it makes for a lot of interesting decisions. And I just want you guys to remember how great Carcassonne can be. Hi there, friends. Lana and I here wanted to continue the conversation that I started in my last video, and that was um, titled How to Spot a Real Gamer. But this time, I want to kind of go a little bit further and give you all some food for thought um, based on a couple tweets that I saw recently. So the first one is from Ella Loves Board Games and that's, uh, she said, people who play Catan or Throw Throw Burrito or Uno don't have to graduate to other games. They can just keep playing these games and it's totally fine. In fact, sometimes I feel like they're having more fun. Those are some good points. In a follow-up tweet, um, Rodney Smith um, quoted Ella's tweet and responded saying, I'm thinking about the term gateway games more often. I get it. I've used it. I'll likely use it again from habit, but I don't like that it implies those games are just practice to get you on a journey to become a real gamer where you're finally playing Maracaibo, etc. This is actually a good point too. So is the term gateway game beneficial? I think it can be for people already in the hobby because we do as a group like to provide recommendations for people who want to get their friends and their family into the hobby. And to us, a gateway game often means a lighter game, an easier to teach game, an easier to learn game. And Lana, Lana likes gateway games, right? Don't you? Yeah. Um, but this, the fact that it's called gateway, like nobody has to, you don't have to start with gateway games and move on to something else. You can just, keep playing what we call gateway games forever. And so I think by using the term gateway game, especially around non-gamers or people who game more casually, um, it can actually be a little bit gatekeeping um, because it implies that they've only taken 
the first step. And for some people that might be the case. They might be just like a lot of us where they start with those games and they end up playing a lot of other games um, in the future, but that they don't have to. So I just want us to be a little bit more conscientious about how we use the term gateway game. It's not a bad thing and it, it can be very beneficial, but we wanna make sure that we're using it in contexts where it doesn't necessarily inhibit the gaming habits of people who like to game a little bit more casually um, because that's totally cool. All right, friends, that's it for today. Uh, from me and Lana, we'll say bye. <laughs> Hi, everybody, I'm Starla, and you may know me from Our Family Plays Games. I don't have my husband on the side of me this time, so you're just gonna be talking to me. So I was asked to do a little piece for Bits and Bobs about bringing families to the table, because that's something that we really talk about on our channel, Our Family Plays Games. So with us, we like to bring different games that our family enjoys. We like to talk about the game so that we know what we're going to bring to the table for that night. So sometimes we have to figure out what people want to do. So if you just want to do something that's fun and light, we may bring a lighter game to the table, such as a roll for it. Or if we want to have more thought in that game, you know, we really want to sit down and analyze and maybe have a little analysis paralysis, we may bring something to the table like Five Tribes or like Terra Mystica. But there are so many games that you can have, but you need to know your family and what your family likes. So there's to me, there's no set game that's going to bring a family to the table. It just depends on what your family enjoys. Some families like co-op. I'm not a big co-op fan. If you've ever watched our channel, you hear me say, Starla doesn't do co-op. But some families love co-op. And for some families, a family game may be Pandemic. I've never played Pandemic, so I'm not too familiar with it. But I know it's a really a big co-op that people love to play. But as for our family, we have a great variety of games that we love. Now, some of our top games that we love to bring to the table, when it's just family night, maybe we've invited a few friends over, is Ticket to Ride. That's one of our favorites, especially for someone who's never played a game. So we want to make sure we introduce them to something that they can get comfortable with and that's easy to learn. And for us, when we're just playing, we may play anything. So it's kind of hard to say what's going to bring your family to the table because you have to know your family. But for us, we have a variety of games we love. But the main thing about our family games is they must, they must be fun. All of our games have to give us some type of enjoyment or it's just not worth the time to put it on the table. We, we have to love what we do. Otherwise, it becomes work and the people are not going to enjoy it. And we have a teenager. So with the teenager, you got to have some fun. And so one of his favorite games, and I got to share that because we have a son who's a teenager. One of his favorite games is King of Tokyo. He loves the monsters. But the funny thing is, we just got a few weeks back Quacks of Quickenburg. And he loves that too. It's kind of a pressure luck kind of game. So you just never know. But have a conversation with your family. Talk to them about some of the things they enjoy. You may have girls. Maybe they like to play cards. So find a game that has cards. Or if you have guys like I do in my household, maybe something that's space themed or has monsters or has dice. And those are the kind of games that are going to bring you and your family hours and hours of enjoyment. So that's really all I have right now about bringing the family to the table with board games, figure out what your family likes, get those type of games, and everybody will have a great time. So that's it for me. Again, I'm Starla from My Family Plays Games. Hope you have a great day. Hi, uh, I'm Katherine Stipple. In the games industry, I've designed the game Nyctophobia. And I've recently started doing closed captioning here for Girls Game Shell. Um, so today I wanted to talk about closed captions. Closed captioning is taking the spoken words in um, videos, TV shows, movies, etc. and having them as text on screen. So this is really important for um, folks that are uh, deaf or hard of hearing to make the content more accessible for them. Closed captions and subtitles are sometimes used interchangeably but closed captions will have audio cues where subtitles do not. So if there's a car honking in the distance or if a song starts playing, closed captioning will note those. 
Now with a basic overview of what it is, how can you start putting closed captions on your videos? So one of the cool things with YouTube is it will automatically auto-generate captions for you. Uh, unfortunately, these aren't always correct, especially in terms of things like uh, people's names or game names, for instance. So to start off simple, you can just go into the auto-generated captions and correct them for words, grammar, punctuation, those types of things. If you want to get started doing some more in-depth captioning, uh, here are a couple of important things to consider. First, you want to make sure the transcription is right. So that's uh, all of the individual words, punctuation, uh, grammar, things like that. Then once you have that all set up, you'll want to start breaking them into their individual captions. You'll want to make sure there's only one sentence per caption, and you'll want to keep them relatively short so that someone's not reading a paragraph on screen. So I generally keep my captions to under 60 characters. So what happens if your caption is more than 60 characters? It's a very long sentence. It just keeps going on and on and on and on. Then you'll have to break up the sentence since there are multiple captions. So to break up a sentence, you'll want to either break it at some natural pause, or you'll want to break it up at different prepositions or conjunctions like and, but, or. Once you have all your captions accurate, you'll want to time them. So you'll start the caption at about the start of the first word and last until about the last sound of the last word. You will want to make sure though that if someone's talking very quickly or your captions are short, that the caption stays long enough on screen to read. And that's pretty much all you have to know to get started captioning. Uh, I hope to see your more accessible content around. Bye. It's convention time, and you're going to go meet other people, look them in the eye, and confidently give them an answer when they ask you what your favorite game is. No need to panic. Everything's fine. No one's going to judge you or start trying to make you jump through hoops about who's a more serious gamer because they play 18xx games or they have all the hotness and they know what's really going on in current events and board games. Just breathe. Okay, breathe. Think about games that make you feel calm and relaxed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, like pencil first games. They have spacious. Sunset over water. Oh yeah, and speaking of other chill games, there's like Takedo. That's a good one. This is about your favorite, your number one. You're gonna go in there when they ask you that question because I always ask you that question and you're going to actually make a decision for once and pick something because you obviously can never even remember what your top five are. So just pick the one that you love. Dead of Winter. I really still have a special place in my heart for Dead of Winter. It was my favorite game when I first started getting into board games. There was Dead of Winter and it was so different. Like you could play with your lying secretive friends and the artwork was fantastic and oh my God. Wait, when was the last time I played Dead of Winter? Do I still like Dead of Winter? Why don't people play Dead of Winter anymore? All right, maybe I should pick something I played more recently. Uh, something you enjoy, but maybe not too easy because if you pick something that's too easy they're going to think you're an idiot and that you don't know how to strategize but i also just really like games you get to sit down and play in 20 minutes but then also not too heavy i don't want to pick the heaviest game i like because then it looks like i'm trying too hard oh yeah i love twilight imperium i mean i do love twilight imperium even if i'm terrible at it okay well maybe twilight imperium isn't safe but what if they think i am one of those players that's really good at learning how to attack people when really it makes me drastically uncomfortable. You could always go with a baseline game that you just love. Sentient. Will that be a disappointing answer? I mean, no one ever really has anything to say about Sentient when you bring it up and you love it so much. Like, oh my God, the artwork. I wonder if New Angeles is anything like Sentient and that feeling where it's like you're a corporation building automatons and... Ah! Okay, focus, 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 focus. Favorite game, Dinosaur Islands. Dinosaur Meeples, fun. Good, nostalgic, 90s. Is that two something? Will they laugh at me? I like games, I like games, and I like people, and I like people when they're engaged with a game, so that's that's getting me somewhere. I, I, I love the experience of sitting down at the table and watching people think, and I love the experience of watching banter. Oh my gosh, I love games that bring out banter. What's a really 
great game for that. I mean, party games, obviously, because those are great for getting people to just loosen up, have fun, and laugh. But if I say I enjoyed playing Billionaire Banshee with people and introducing them to gaming through party games, will they just think of me as like a party gamer and therefore not a real gamer? Am I worrying too much? Is there a right answer to this? Do I even have a favorite game? My name is Monique and my favorite game is What's up everyone? My name is Monica and I'm from geeksagogo.com. Today I am back to give you another makeup tutorial. Now July 27 was Gary Gygax day and I wanted to honor him by creating some sort of makeup look based out of Dungeons and Dragons. Now here's where the fun part starts. So you grab a, a 20 sided die, roll it, and whatever number is on the top that's going to be what the makeup look will be. So in true D&D fashion, if you roll 15 to 20, 20 which is the critical hit, you get to choose your own look. Now, if you roll lower than that, you need to look at this chart that I made. So check this out. This chart that I made is basically kind of like the beginning stages of you creating your own character sheet when you play D&D. So like I said earlier, if I rolled anything lower than a 15, I have to look and see what type of class, roll again, and see what type of race, and finally, for my third roll, find out what the background of my character is. So here we go. So for my first roll, it looks like I am a warlock. In the second roll, it looks like my race is a kobold. And finally, my background is a criminal. This would be a really interesting look because kobolds are like dragons. So I need to make myself look like a dragon. All right, so I did like patch up a little bit of uh, my blemishes around my face, but being that I'm going to be looking like a dragon today, I need to pick out a color. So let's go on ahead and grab some green eyeshadow. Check out the pop of that color. It is ridiculous. Um, I do have a green base on my eye, but I'm using a blue base all over my face because this is the only available color that I have. And this is Paradise um, Cream Makeup or water-based makeup from Meron. I've used this a lot of times and I just love it so much. Now we're gonna fill it in with more green stuff. But yeah, I really feel like I look like Captain Planet right now. Now dipping into a dark green eyeshadow, I'm going to do a little bit of contouring. Now I've got a different shade of green and I'm going to just try to blend everything in. There you go, now I look like Gamora. Okay, now with a medium brown type of color, now you start drawing your details in. So here I'm just kind of just creating my own like scale. Okay, kobolds also have horns, so I'm gonna draw my mini horns in here. Okay, I've got my green lipstick and I'm just gonna apply it. It's up here. Okay, now I'm going to grab some eyeliner and put some more detailing in. <laughs> Alright, now I'm going to finish off this look by putting some highlight. Well everyone, I hope you enjoyed the look that I created today. It is definitely different and definitely hard, so <laughs> I do suggest you try it. Um, if you can even use the chart that I had like used to create this makeup look to create your own character. Thanks for sticking around. Once again, my name is Monica from Geeksago.com. I'll see you next time. Hi everyone, my name is Emma and I wanted to sit down and talk to you about comfort zones today. Some of you may know that I 
like last year I started posting content online and for me I broke out of quite a lot of comfort zones for myself. I think this video is another one because I have been putting, I've been feeling like I've been putting the bar really high for this because I wanted to do well because these ladies are so amazing and I'm so honored to be a, like invited on their channel. Um, so for me, I was like, oh, I need to do something serious or I want to show other sides of me because I think I mostly do funny videos and not the serious part, but the serious part is also a big part <laughs> of the whole whole community, of course. And comfort zones are, of course, a uh, zone where we feel most comfortable, we're most at ease, and stepping out of them can be quite um, scary, quite like little panic moments the, the moment you press the tweet button or the post or the upload button you your heart will start racing or at least in my case i'm just speaking out of my experience i can of course not not talk about other people's experiences but um my heart is definitely racing right now um but if we would always stick to our comfort zones we would not learn about new experiences new people new games if you always play the games you just learned as a child what if you've never played a party game let's just just make a very weird example what if you never played a party game and you would be like oh i haven't played it so i'm not gonna try it maybe you will miss out on a whole variety of games that could be your jam <laughs> Not, no pun included with the, uh, le the letter jam that's on my closet, but jokes aside, I think that it's not only for the games, it's also the people you play with. If you're always playing with the same people, uh, if you go to a board game event and you always go with the same people, I mean, that's totally fine, but imagine all the possibilities of opening your group up to new people, uh, people who may not have yet played games, people who may not have had a group to play with and make sure everyone feels welcome in those environments, that could be out of your comfort zone because you're like, oh, I already know these people, I know I will have a good time. But it's so important to be embracing for everyone in this community and in other aspects of life as well. Oh man. <laughs> um, so I think it's really important that we understand that and take that in account when we play, like walk on this earth <laughs> um yeah so uh this is another comfort zone broken for me i hope you try to step out of some of your comfort zones as well because i have been very happy to do so so far and i hope you will experience the same thing. Stay safe, stay pointless. <laughs> Good night. Hi everyone, it's Stella from Maple University. Today I am going to talk about one of my favorite cooperative adventure games, The Seventh Continent. So one of these is the base game, one is the expansion. Now, I can't really remember which one's which now because we kind of like put them together and mix them around trying to fit everything in one box but failed there's so many cards the box is so heavy anyway you might have heard of the famous seventh continent it is a kind of a choose your own adventure type of game where you get a card you choose where you want to go you interact with the objects in the card now i play this with Terence um, a few times so it's it takes us a lot from one to a different scenarios i really like i used to be uh, more of a computer gamer where i play a lot of point and click so this game has got um, a bit of a feel of it now i won't actually show a lot of this on the camera because i am trying to avoid spoilers of course 
but I'm mainly playing a lot of those like Pink Quest um, and what else? It's, it's a few of them, I can't remember off of my head, but King's Quest is one of them. So you go adventuring, you try to interact with objects, you try to combine objects or whatever you do to get the results. Um, it's a puzzle solving. So Seven Continent is similar, where you do that, you got a card, you open up and you're playing as a character. Your character might have certain power and with that you can help the team to try to solve the puzzle and trying to advance. Now you must do this before the time runs out and the timing mechanics in this game is by going through the curse deck, I think it's called, the card. And once you've gone through it, depending how difficult you want it to be, so once it's out, next time you draw a curse, then you're out, um, you get to finish the part of the game by then. So that's Seven Continent. What are your favorite cooperative point and click games? There are a few of them out there. I also like Choose Your Own Adventure. That's another one. So I think there are two um, that's already came out by now. Um, just write in the comment sections, what is your favorite point and click style adventure game? Hey everyone, welcome to August, which if you're a little like me, feels like it's only been a week since March and a decade since March. It's been a really interesting 2020. I know a number of you are about to perhaps start on a really interesting educational journey as we have to start making decisions for our family about going back to school and doing that sort of thing. And I encourage you and I'm proud of you no matter what decision you make, make sure you're doing it for your individual family. and. I'm sure it'll all work out. I did want to talk specifically though to the folks that are considering some home education because, and I know I've mentioned this before, we are 20 year veterans in game schooling. So we've used games throughout the kids' education to teach various concepts from economics to history to really anything you can think of. And I wanted to start talking about that by talking about one of my favorite types of board games, which is Point Salad. So in Point Salad, you earn points and perhaps influence the end of the game and maybe even win by collecting points through a various bunch of means. Maybe it's your strategy is to build sets. Maybe your strategy is to advance a marker so that you can reach a goal first. In Point Salad, it's specifically that you're using whatever you think is the best method to make the end goal. And that's sort of the way I'd like to encourage you to think about education. Even if your kids are the same age, uh, in the same grade, sharing the same DNA as twins, they're going to learn differently, every human being does. And so home education is a little bit about finding out what works best for your kids and for your lifestyle. Maybe one kid is really into doing math worksheets and the other one learns better by learning how to bake and work their fractions through cups and measurements. Education is a lot of exploration. And so I encourage you to take the time to explore with your child, find out not just what their interests are, but how that learning path works for them, what clicks for them. It's point salad education wise. So, and, and consider mixing in a few games for that. There are a ton of historically based games, games with amazing themes, games with a little secret education in there where kids don't really realize that they've actually just totted up a row full of numbers to get their best score in something like Point Salad. So as you launch on whatever journey happens to be the best for your family, keep that in mind. Every kid's gonna be different. And certainly this year's situation has proven just how resilient everyone in this situation is. Good luck and best of luck no matter what you decide to do. And if you're thinking about giving game scrolling a try, feel free to drop us an email. I will talk about this all day long until you're bored of it, I promise you. Have a great month and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.